sleep, according to Andrew Huberman, is truly vital. In this video, he explains the profound importance of this simple fact. When we sleep, our bodies and minds recharge, repairing and rejuvenating themselves. It's not just about feeling rested, sleep profoundly impacts our overall health and our well-being. Well, if I'm not well rested, I do a hypnosis or yoga nidra in order to recover my sleep. That works really well. It helps consolidate memories, enhances our learning, and strengthens the immune system. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think most people, I would say about 75% or more people have sleep issues. By prioritizing quality sleep, we unlock a cascade of benefits that just ripple throughout our lives, leading to improved focus, creativity, and overall happiness. So, let's embrace the power of sleep. It's the key to unlocking our full potential. And then in the final third is where you finally get to relax because the brain doesn't shift states very quickly. We can go from sleep to wakefulness quickly. We can go from wakefulness to sleep quickly, but we don't shift between different states of consciousness like a step function, except in rare cases, right? Fear is one. All of a sudden we hear an explosion right now. It's a step function. We're in fear or we're in alertness. In a captivating video, Andrew Huberman sheds light on the incredible significance of sleep. It's not just about closing our eyes. It is an essential process that fuels our bodies and our minds. See, so while we sleep, our brains actively work to solidify memories, making learning more effective. Moreover, sleep strengthens our immune system, helping us stay healthy and ward off illness. But the story don't end there. So that you can start thinking about other possibilities or, you know, there are instances, I think everyone's been in this kind of situation where the thing that's stressing you out is not gonna get resolved today and you need to sleep. And of course, you know you need to sleep and then you can't sleep. And then of course that creates a compounding stress and now you're stressed about not being able to sleep. And then over the course of the next few days, you, you know, dissolve into a puddle of tears. Prioritizing restful nights set the stage for a vibrant and fulfilling life. It enhances our cognitive abilities. It boosts our mood and even allows us to tackle challenges with renewed energy. Embrace the power of sleep. It's the foundation for a remarkable existence. Even for a conversation at work, step out in front of the building. And then in the evening, dim those screen lights. If you're out on stage and you got the blaring lights in your eyes and you're mm -hmm. dealing with that, afterwards, there are some things that, that can help. And then for most people, you know, make sure you're not going to bed right after chugging a big glass of water. One of the most common w problems with sleep is people wake up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. Andrew Huberman's video highlights the paramount importance of sleep. Far from being a mere luxury, quality sleep is a biological necessity that supports our overall well-being. During sleep, our bodies repair and they regenerate, optimizing our physical health. Meanwhile, our brains consolidate information and they clear out toxins, improving cognitive function. Uh, I'm waking up these days around 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. I'm trying to go to sleep by about 10.30 p.m. Sometimes it's 11, sometimes it's 10. I wake up, um, and I have to be careful here because whenever I've described my routine in a little bit of detail, people always say, I can't believe you don't go to the bathroom. The benefits extend beyond the night. A good night's sleep translates into heightened focus to enhance productivity and better decision-making during the day. I mean, Skyrim taught us all this, you know, sleep for eight hours, get more skills, whatever. So let's prioritize sleep as a non-negotiable part of our lives. By doing so, we set ourselves up for success, ensuring that every day begins with a well-rested mind and a well-rested body. First of all, we have to distinguish between modulators and mediators, and I'll do this very briefly. There are a lot of things that will modulate your state of focus, but they don't directly mediate your sense of focus. So for instance, if right now a fire alarm went off in this building, it would modulate our attention. We would get up and leave. It would be very hard to do what we're doing with that banging in the background, at least at first. So it's modulating focus, but it's not really involved in the mechanisms of focus, right? In the same way, being well-rested when you sleep, your autonomic nervous system that adjusts states of alertness and focus and calm works better than when you're sleep deprived. So if you're sleeping better, you're gonna focus better. So I always answer this way uh, to a question like this because the best thing that anyone can do for their mental health, physical health and performance in athletic or cognitive endeavors or creative endeavors is to make sure that you're getting enough quality sleep enough of the time for you. And that's gonna differ. We could talk about what that means. Now, in terms of things that mediate focus, without getting into the description of mechanisms, because we have podcasts about that, it's very clear that mental focus follows visual focus, provided that you're a sighted person. 
Much of the training that's being done now in China to teach kids to focus better literally has them stare at a target, blinking every so often, but really training themselves to breathe calmly and maintain a tight visual aperture. When you read, you have to maintain a tight visual aperture. You're literally scrolling like a highlighter in your mind's eye, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of obvious once you hear it. So for people that have problems focusing sleep well, learn to dilate and contract your visual field consciously. This can be done if you practice it a little bit. And then, be, as I said before, it is very hard to get into a state of focus like a step function immediately, like snapping your fingers. What you can do is you can pick any object, but ideally an object at roughly the same distance, placed at roughly the same distance to which you're going to do that work. So in his video, Andrew Huberman emphasizes the incredible importance of sleep in our lives. It is not just a state of unconsciousness. It is a vital process that our bodies and our minds, <laughs> what they need, it's a non-option. If you're having a full-blown panic attack, then the alertness system is, you know, it's as if the seesaw is tilted all that way. If you have, um, if you're deeply asleep, well, then the calmness system is really tilted down. You could say that's a portion of the seesaw. This is all kind of obvious and it dates back, you know, 100 years or so, which isn't that long in the history of science, but we've known this sort of thing for a while. Okay, what's interesting and I think more relevant nowadays is to think about one's own interpretation of those signals and how that relates to anxiety and, as you pointed out, exploration, and then to think about where the nodes of control are. In this seesaw uh, model that, uh, that I'm putting forward, the seesaw has to include what I would call a hinge, a location in the middle in which you can voluntarily adjust the seesaw to either be more tilted toward alert or more tilted toward asleep. And for many people, they find that their overall level of autonomic arousal is either inappropriate or inadequate for the demands of their life. Inappropriate meaning their heart is racing, they feel more jittery, more um, as if movement would be the default and worry would be the default and, pre and anticipation is the default than is appropriate for their circumstances. Waking up in the morning and feeling stressed, for instance, immediately without any immediate cause or maybe stress about real life events. For other people, they feel uh, more exhausted than they would like. They're having a hard time leaning into the pressures of daily life. Both of those, even though they have sort of polarized phenotypes, they look very different. In one case, over-energized, uh, and in one case, under-energized, both originate within the autonomic nervous system. And we can reliably say from work done in animals and humans that that is not the consequence of the alertness system or the calmness system being disrupted, but rather that that hinge in the middle is dysregulated. While we sleep, our bodies repair tissues, they release growth hormones, and they regulate metabolism. Simultaneously, our brains consolidate memories, promoting better learning and information retention, but that's only the beginning of it. Prioritizing sleep quality leads to a more balanced and fulfilled life. It enhances your mood, it reduces your stress, and it improves your ability to handle challenges. So let's recognize the power of sleep and create a sleep routine that nurtures our well-being. I do, I'm a big napper. I love taking a 20 minute nap or doing an NSDR in the afternoon. The rule on naps, and Matt Walker and I agree on this, is that naps should be shorter than 90 minutes and they should, um, you should only take them if they, if they don't disrupt your nighttime sleep. Uh, I love naps I'm cons and I can sleep anywhere, anytime now because I do the NSDR. So if I just decide I'm gonna lie down and pass out, I can just do that. It just happens. And I, um, I, so I'm big on naps for a couple of reasons. Um, there are several very good papers that were published in the last few years in the journal Cell Report showing that short naps and NSDR, I should say, has some good science to support it, um, accelerates neuroplasticity and learning, especially if you take that nap within four to six hours after a very intense learning bout. There's something about that um, sleep state that allows the brain to rewire. And most of the rewiring and neuroplasticity occurs during deep sleep, but also during these short sleep bouts um, that we call naps or NSDR. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan. And yeah, my evening is basically uh, just trying to take things down a notch. Um, and everything's a little bit quieter, a little bit mellower. Uh, occasionally I'll get a, a bout of focused writing in during that one hour peak or something of that sort. I'm just really trying to taper everything. I try not walk the dog at night. 
but it sometimes the dog needs to walk. So it's not that I, you know, I'm, I'm super strict about this. Occasionally I will um, go, you know, take the dog out for a walk or watch a movie, but most of the time it's, it's a progressive mellowing toward the evening. And then in the morning, um, you know, it's, it, we started pretty early today. Um, and I, I'm up and I'm up and at them and all day long, I'm going, going, going. Mr. Andrew Huberman's video emphasizes the importance in sleep in our lives, the utmost importance. Beyond just a period of rest, sleep plays a critical role in our physical and our mental health. During sleep, our bodies recover and they heal, while our brains undergo essential processes that enhance memory and learning. Now, there are situations in life I should just mention, such as sleep deprivation, or uh, in particular, that tend to make this whole set of systems with prefrontal cortex and limbic stuff and ACC and insula kind of dysregulated. It makes it harder to manage. That goes without saying, right? You know, the quickest way to peel somebody apart is to sleep deprive them for two or three nights. One night, you're probably fine. Right, right. So, you know, all the basics of, of self-care, of good nutrition, social connection, sleep, uh, exercise, sunlight, those still apply. I just want to mention that. I, I want to make sure I answer your question about gene expression and, and permanent changes um, because I've, I've failed to do that thus far. One of the things that is absolutely key about the dopamine system is that it has a fast component. Dopamine is released, more adrenaline, aka epinephrine can be released and you can, re, you know, this sort of upward spiral of energy and, and, and sort of success with the occasional drops, right? I mean, nobody succeeds in every task, right? Sometimes the phone rings or the doorbell rings and you fail, uh, you know, uh, goodness, you fail to clean the cup. You come home, like, are you going to crash into a puddle of tears? No, you just clean it then and then put it away, right? Um, of course. But there's a slow system associated with achieving wins, even small wins. And that slow system is in the form of hormonal control that then translates to gene control. So two hormones in particular, testosterone and estrogen, um, which are present in both men and women, males and females, of course, um, but to varying degrees, um, are both secreted when the dopamine system is activated. This has to do with the relationship between dopaminergic neurons and the pituitary gland, which releases gonadotropins and luteinizing hormones, which then stimulate the testes and the ovaries, et cetera, to release the so-called sex steroid hormones. The sex steroid hormones, testosterone and estrogen, of course, are involved in reproductive biology, but they are both vitally important, provided they are in the proper ratios, for motivational biology. However, sleep's benefit extends far beyond just, you know, science. Ooh. By understanding and prioritizing sufficient and restful sleep, we unlock a world of possibilities. We experience increased productivity, heightened creativity, and improved emotional well-being. So, let us honor our bodies and our minds by recognizing sleep as the cornerstone of a thriving and purposeful existence. I'll start with what I've doubled down on. I've doubled down on the idea, which perhaps I stated last time we spoke and perhaps not, but I certainly believe that our state of mind and body at any point in time is strongly dictated by our state of mind and body in the hours and days prior to that. And on the one hand, people are going to hear that and say, well, duh, you know, if you're sleep deprived, you're going to feel like garbage. And if you're well rested, you'll feel great. That's kind of the top contour of it. Mm -hmm. But when one looks at the neuroscience, for instance, of sleep, you start to realize that, you know, the amount of rapid eye movement sleep that you're going to get in any 90 minute bout of sleep as your sleep is broken up into these 90 minute segments, more or less is strongly dictated by the ratio of slow wave sleep, aka deep sleep and rapid eye movement sleep that you had in the previous 90 minute bout. And then when you start to look at the research in terms of waking states, you start to find that your ability to be focused, say for a bout of work in the morning or the afternoon or a creative brainstorm session, or I don't know, to maybe drill into some personal issue that you're dealing with during therapy or just on a walk or while journaling is not a square wave function. You know, none of us should sit down and expect ourselves to just drop into that state. Mm -hmm. Much of our ability to move into that state effectively, whatever effective means, right? Whatever the target or goal of that bout, as I'm calling it, is, is going to be dictated by what happened in the previous moments and hours. And so when I zoom out from that, what I've doubled down on is this idea that there are just a core set of foundational things that we have to re-up every 24 hours. 
The other thing is that many of the people waking up after four or five hours were supposed to go to bed earlier. Remember, melatonin puts you to sleep, but doesn't keep you asleep. So many of these people might be going to bed at 11 o'clock, waking up at three or 4 a.m. Like, ah, here I am again, when actually they need to go to bed at nine. Now there's this weird asymmetry in the way that our system is built in that we can push through fatigue, but it's very hard to make ourselves fall asleep. So some people need to discover that they actually were meant to go to bed earlier. I, I know people think about night owls and morning larks and this kind of thing. That's a big uh, idea in industry. And to some extent, it's true. There are genetic polymorphisms that relate to these things. But for the most part, most people were, you know, evolved in under conditions where they went to sleep shortly after the sun went down. So I'm with age, I'm going to bed earlier and earlier. <clears throat> I realize there's some lifestyle factors too, but I do think that there is something powerful about going to bed a little earlier. There, I keep asking Matt Walker if there's any science to support this, and he tells me no, but I find and many people find that every hour of sleep before midnight recharges them more deeply than the hours after midnight. And I don't know what this is, um, but I find if I go to bed at nine o'clock and I'll sometimes wake up at midnight. I'm like, ah, oh, it's only midnight. What am I going to do? But then I fall back asleep. I'll wake up at three or four a.m. and I'm ready to go. And and that's that's great. I mean, you can get so much done in the hours between you know four and seven a.m. Fewer distractions. Your focus can be very high. The problem is most people are going to bed late. They're waking up at four or five hours later. Then they're scrolling on their phone because it's a very kind of passive sensory input. They're trying to get themselves back to sleep, it doesn't work. And then throughout the day, they're working at about 75% capacity. So I would encourage those people to just start going to bed earlier. You know, I think thanks to the incredibly hard work of Dr. Matt Walker at Berkeley, mm -hmm. right? The sleep diplomat on Twitter, right? It's such a great name because it's so appropriate. I mean, a decade ago or so, you know, it was like, I'll sleep when I'm dead. That was the, the dominant mentality out there. And yeah, sleep's great, but you know, getting stuff done is more important. I mean, Matt has really impressed on everybody that our mental health, our physical health, and our ability to perform is so strongly dependent on our ability to get quality sleep. Maybe not every night of our life. Right? I mean, we have to be realistic, but that sleep is vital. So a hat tip is insufficient. So sleep is critical, but sleep is just one of about, I would say five things that really set the, the buoyancy or the foundation upon which our nervous system is able to accomplish these transitions that I'm talking about at all. Mm -hmm. And those five things are sleep, right? In the absence of quality sleep over two or three days, you're just going to fall to pieces. In the presence of quality sufficient sleep over two or three days, you're going to function at an amazing level. There's a gain of function and a loss of function there. It's mm -hmm. not just if you sleep poorly, you function less well. You sleep better, you function much better. Mm -hmm. So sleep, I would say, is at the top of the list. Nutrients, you know, and there are, you can think macronutrients. And so your carnivores are only eating meat and your vegans are only eating plants and your, your omnivores, which is, I think, probably 90% of the world is eating a combination of those. But, you know, quality nutrients, I think that when I look at all of the nutrition literature and arguments out there, it seems that everyone can agree on one thing, which is that probably 80% or more of our nutrition should come from unprocessed or minimally processed sources. Minimally processed would require some cooking, but could survive on the shelf as opposed to packaged foods or highly palatable foods. So you've got sleep, nutrients, but then we should also put in micronutrients. 